Welcome to the Hustle or Bust podcast powered by Paver Art. Our mission is simple, to dive deep into the world of entrepreneurship, small business, and all the success, struggle, and challenges that need to be confronted in the pursuit of growth. We celebrate the entrepreneurial spirit, but perhaps most important, we want you to learn at least one idea that you can put into action immediately to make your investment in time worthwhile. Welcome to episode 28 of the Hustle or Bust podcast. On this episode, we talk about employee engagement and empowerment. There really is a huge business case for this topic. In short, employees that consider themselves highly engaged in their business are 15 times more likely to recommend their employer to friends and colleagues. So we talk about as a business owner, what are those undeniable truths that you believe in as a business owner? We talk about building one-on-one relationships and competing for talent in a competitive workplace. We hope you enjoy it and drop us a line with some feedback. I tell you, this particular subject is near and dear to my heart because I have had trouble with this virtually my entire life, you know, pre-business life and during my entire business life. It's only been within the last few years where I've actually gotten a little better at what I consider to be the empowerment of employees and and, and the delegation of authority. Um, how about you? Yeah, delegation is a tough one. It's uh, for people that like to control things and uh, be hands-on. Delegations, it's a skill, I think. That I'd agree with you. I've It's not a skill that comes easy to a lot of people, and I'm certainly not a master at it, that's for sure. My wife would tell me she, I delegate pretty darn well. <laughs> To her, well, you del- as you delegate to her pretty darn well. That's yeah, I, mean, exactly I right. think I think she's right on that. I can delegate pretty freely to her, but uh, well, it, I think the concept, of, but the concept of delegation does not include with it criticism. Okay, harsh criticism when they're not doing it exactly the way you want it to be done. That's right. So I think <laughs> that might be why she has a problem with that. Right. So, <laughs> my that wife and sarcasm and that. and oh, and yeah. my Jersey wit. I mean, all these things come into play here. Oh my. Well, regardless of the of the arena where this takes place, I think we would both agree it's really really important. And what's what's interesting about bringing this subject up now to me anyway is in the midst of what we're going through here, going into the new year, uh expanding our uh expanding our operation, our you know, expanding our footprint, bringing in new equipment, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a ton of new investment, uh, moving an entire department into its own space. You know, you and I cannot do that by ourselves. That has to be, there has to be other involvement by the employees. Now, what's interesting, um, did a little background research on this. Now, empowerment is one thing. Delegation is another. They are not the same. Okay. And the uh, uh, the the definition. Let's let's let, let's let's at least give ourselves a place to start from. The definition of empowerment. Uh, it's when an employee. It's when the employee knows they have the capability of making responsible business decisions on their own. Okay, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Delegation is when the employee has been given the responsibility to act and maybe even make decisions on behalf of the person that's delegating that particular responsibility, which in a lot of cases would be you or myself, the entrepreneur, the small business owner. And I think also, again, I don't want to get off on too many tangents because we want to be able to cover as many of these as we can. This is, although it's important in every organization, I think it's critical, really critical in small business where you already have a tendency, if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, there might only be one manager, maybe two at the most, okay? And both of those managers are wearing not just management hats, but they're probably getting involved in the day-to-day operation of the business. They're getting their hands dirty. And that's, it's, it's, it's a hard line to straddle sometimes because you, you, you really don't know 
the impact that you have when you try to take over and what, what impact you have on that employee psyche. And that's really, that's really critical. And I think that's really, really important. We're fortunate here, at least at Paver, at, you know, at Paver Art, that a lot of this kind of came into the um, came into play during the last several weeks uh, with the uh, with us acquiring a new piece of a, a new piece of equipment uh, that several people had to get involved with in regards to the setup for that. Uh, all the different contractors that were involved. I mean, between you and myself. And, uh, you know, Brian and John and uh, a couple of the other employees and Nick, there really needed to be empowerment. There really needed to be delegation or else you and I, how else would we have gotten any of the other things done that we needed to get done? So well, why don't we why don't we use that as a jumping off point, Mike, on, in terms of let's think a, a great, little picture. The yep. uh, so we talked about we're, we're acquiring a new space and we're right. splitting out our, our business from the two segments and we're we're essentially mm -hmm. going across the street with half the business. And keeping the other half in the existing place and expanding it, the the floor space. How many contractors do we have on this project? Four. You got a plumber, electrician, a builder, air, air compressor, an air guy. compressor, and, and a plumber. Yeah, plumber, and a plumber, electrician, air compressor, yeah. and a build. Yeah, four four contractors. Yep. And now you got two locations, and you and I are going back and forth between two spots, right? Exactly. While we're still fielding phone calls, right? Um, uh, sending out quotes, writing orders expediting stuff that's supposed to be going out the door. And in the meantime, while all this is going on, the employees are, are running their operation and, you know, on the manufacturing side, making product. Um, it's, you know, we've been through this a couple of times before here at Paver Art, um, you know, uh, one with a move and one with another prior to this, what was it, two years ago or two and a half years ago, and we brought in another major piece of equipment. Uh, but this one, this one takes the cake. Uh, this this has really been a challenge. And um, uh, one of the things that I think I learned during this process was that there will even be the, the occasional employee engagement, if you will, uh, where all of a sudden they do something and they don't even wait for you to say anything. Okay, they just go do it. And I got to tell you, I, that that's, I think that's great. I think that's fantastic. And it really, look, if it's one less thing that we can check off of our list, that's a great thing. The problem with that concept, however, is that you don't know if it's going to take place when in fact, if you're proactive in your business, you have to make sure that that takes place. You have to make sure that that employee understands that we expect from them to um, uh, not just assume responsibility, but move in a positive way to do the right things to expedite that responsibility in, in, in the, the proper way so, th so things get done the way they need to get done. Now, you, you heard what I just said. Things need to get done the way, well, who determines the way they get done? Sometimes, you know, uh, you know I'm wrong. I, I, you know, there's, they have better ideas than I do. They're smarter at certain things than I am. Well, it is, it's, doesn't this come down that to line straddle? And that's very difficult sometimes to kind of give that power up. And that's maybe power is too strong a word, but giving that responsibility up. And it's got nothing to do with putting your stamp on something. It's got everything to do with the fact that you want something to go well. OK, well, you want it to go well. Well, here, here's a couple of concepts, because I think you do need a, a philosophy or some guardrails, whatever you want to uh, think about it. Um, you're a restaurant. I, I'm thinking about our, our buddy, Angelo, right? Sure, you're a restaurant right. and you're going to redo the kitchen. You're going to expand out the restaurant. Who's the best one to organize the kitchen? It's, you would think it would be the chef, the head chef. Right. Exactly. You or I now back to paper art, a manufacturing facility. We're breaking out and we're creating two manufacturing facilities. Right. And breaking out the room. The question is, at least on the paper art side, the business that's our bread and butter. In theory, who's the best one to organize that? You or I or the plant, the folks that are working it every day? Now, the, the folks that are working in it every day should have 80% input into that. Yeah, they're, they really should. They're, they know how to do their jobs better than we do. We're, we're there to facilitate. We have an overall sense, but the people doing the work are usually the best one 
with the most likely chance to have the best outcome. Now, to your point on empowerment, they've got to feel empowered to go make those changes, uh, implement implement the plan, hook up the new machinery, do all of that. If you don't have yeah. a culture, the word that keeps coming to my mind is ownership, right? right. They, they've really got to own a stake in the future, uh, philosophically, where the company's going, or they're never going to be empowered. And they got to feel like they're, they're going to design it because they're the best ones to do it. They're going right. to move the racks. They're going to move the oven where the oven's got to go, all of those things. Generally speaking, I would say 80 to 90% of the time, the people doing the work are the best ones when you're talking about expansion to figure out how to do it. Uh, probably oversimplifying here, but get the people closest to the line of fire uh, weighing in on how to redesign things in the context of growth and construction, I believe. Exactly. Well, I, look, the well, let's just be honest, because I, I, I really thought about this um, because I've had trouble with this all my business life. And, ha and people have told me about this, you know, not just my wife, <laughs> although, although she's she may have been the most critical uh, because she knows she can get away with it. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, you know, I have been told that at times I can be a control freak and. It's easy to get defensive about your position being a control freak, okay? Uh, you know, trying to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. You know, and one more one more cliche, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to cuss me out on the air here. But the, at the end of the day, when you're a small company and you're wearing many hats, sometimes those lines are blurred. Those, you know, th those lines between what you should be doing and what somebody else should be doing. OK, what you should be doing to make sure that that other person knows that they, you know, that they're responsible for this. Make sure that they're equipped to to make those decisions on their own. I mean, that's that's I see that as your responsibility and my responsibility. And for so long, it wasn't like that here because, you know, and, and by the way. You've gotten very good, you know. We've we've all gotten very good at not just our respective jobs, but being, you know, hypercritical about way the way other things should be done in the organization too. And I don't know that that's very healthy. And I'll tell you what it comes down to. In my case, uh, you know, it, it it comes down to trust. You know, it, it's easy for you and I to teach and mentor. It's easy for the employee or employees that we know are capable of handling that responsibility to take that responsibility, but we have to be able to trust them to do that. And it's, I'll tell you, they see through that shit. They see through that very easily. If you don't, it, they can tell when they know you don't trust them. Now the good ones, the good ones that are truly proactive and really want to take that responsibility will look you right in the eye and tell you, Hey, I can do this back off. Don't I understand what you're trying to do? You're, you know, the, you know, you've stated our goals here very specifically. The objective of this particular job. Now let me go do it and leave me alone. Okay. It's, but but sometimes, the, sometimes I need to hear that. Okay? But the key is with that is it all comes down to communication, right? So exactly, exactly. In a small business, to your point, which is a great one, you're wearing a ton of hats. At what point do you take the other hat off, give it to the person that's kind of like in charge of that area? The communication, let's say we're getting involved in a plant because we're wearing a lot of hats. We're trying to get it done. It's the fire of the day. Like a general manager or an owner of a restaurant getting involved in the kitchen because they've got to get it done. they got to get that thing. You know, the certificate of occupancy is coming, the, the whole bit. And they're opening sure. it on Monday. So the owner, general manager, whatever it is, that's getting in the kitchen and not the chef, if the chef is feeling that, hey, owner, hey, general manager, get the hell out of here. I know what the hell I'm doing. But he's not saying it. He's not communicating it. He's not voicing it. There's the problem, right? So communication is a two-way street. So it could be just as simple as the plant manager and or the chef is not opening their freaking mouth to say, I got it. Let me Give me the ball. I'll run with it. That happens all the time in business, doesn't it? But you got to be careful that you're not the person that's throwing the wet blanket on that other person. Okay. Because they, not everybody, not everybody is, 
you know, I, I mean, I'm pretty much out there. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open. You know, I, I like to engage. Um, uh, and sometimes that can be a little intimidating to another person who's not that way. Right. Okay. And that person may have a great idea. That person may be able to be, may be very, very capable of handling um, those types of those types of responsibilities that would free us up, free me up, free you up to do other things that are, you know, that we're really good at that will help also push the needle, maybe the sales needle forward, okay, uh, or the investment needle forward. Well, any business out there, you know, the CapEx needle forward, you know, you know, any business out there that's thinking about growth and has it has actually put real adult money behind growth. And that could be a number different. They got a new piece of machinery. They got new space. They tacked on an employee or two or three. Right. That money's not coming back to you and you'll see grow enough to make that money come back to you. Right. Yep. So exactly. let's say you added three production people. <clears throat> You better you better start selling something and fill them up and start making them productive, or all you did is add expense to the business. Oh, Let's yeah. say you add a salesperson. If they're not selling all day long and generating enough money to pay for their salary and then some, that's a problem. So if you've got now, now we happen to be in a case, we're investing across the board in marketing, in new space, and equipment and new employees, right? Double yep. whammy. So if you and I, I think you're here's what it comes down to. You and I are wearing five hats. If we don't take three of them off and get back focused on what we know how to do, selling and marketing, this thing's going to freaking, the dollars are going to suck out of the bottom line at a rapid rate because yeah. you take on new space, the rent starts right away, the utilities take on a new employee. They need time to come up to speed, right? To learn the business, to learn the craft. Great point. So you Great and point. I, by name, probably the biggest behavior change that we need as a small little business is the two top people from a level standpoint have to change their behavior, I think. Yeah, I agree. And or all the investment's going to come right out of the bottom line and we're not going to make it back. When I started, when I did the background into the into, into this, this subject, the term that came up, which I think ties most directly to what you just said, is micromanagement. That's one thing. It's easy to, it's easy to defend that position of micromanaging when you're so small that and if you're in what we talked about this for years when you're in survival mode you're just you're you're trying to keep the business going okay but we've gotten way past that now you know we're now four years into growth mode thinking and in order to, in order to do that in order for that to move forward in order for that needle to move forward uh you you have to assume you know larger amounts of risk you can't bring on all that additional risk without making sure that you've got a team that can um, help you spread the responsibility around and give them the capabilities to make those decisions on their own. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be involved, okay? But that involvement could be a short meeting every day before before the workday starts. You know, a follow up to check. You know, we're 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 going to check budgets. We're going to check the targets that we set up at the beginning of the year and broke down on a weekly or monthly basis. That's, you know, I think that's critical. I really do think that's critical. And and what you just said there, I think, is really, really important. Well, I think it comes down to, wouldn't you agree, or what are your thoughts on, I'm a big believer in culture, and, and culture is one of those hard to define. Every company's got one. Some are well-defined and some are kind of not really well-defined, but your culture has to be ready for growth if that's where you aspire to go. You don't just say, right. well, we've been trucking along at $3 million in revenue. Next year, we're going to do $4 million. We've been doing $3 million for the past 10 years. Let's set a goal for $4 million. <clears throat> you got the same exact staff. You got the same exact way of doing it. All right, you'll spend more money on advertising. If your culture is not ready for a dynamic change in where you want to go with it, you're just not going to get there. Or you're going to break a lot of things in the process. Exactly. Imagine yeah. on day one, if I came in, and said, we're going to double the business and we're going to do it by next year, right out of the shoot. Mm -hmm. And we got the same exact team and we've been operating for, uh, what, 16 years when I came in? Mm -hmm. Yep. How would that have gone? I mean, that would have that would have been a rejection of the new owner, I think. That Maybe would have been not outwardly. That would have been a trust issue on the other side. Right. Uh, it, when you, as soon as I hear, as soon as I hear the word culture or corporate culture, used in a discussion like this 
especially when you're talking about a small business. I think it's, although it's the it's the same concept, I think it's completely different in a small business than it is in a, in a, in a much larger business where you've got divisions, you've got departments, you've got 30 people working in an apartment with a, with a department head, but he's one of 25 department heads. Here, you don't have anything like that. Corporate culture here is more almost a, a, a result of attitude and personality than it is, um, okay, this is the way we're going to act every day. You know, these are the, this is the business etiquette that we're going to see to every day. Christ, if you try doing that around here, I mean, boy, they'll, they'll call you on the carpet pretty quickly. Come on, guys. That's not the way we work here. We've never worked that way here. You know, we're very open, but we don't cross the line. And I think that's what we do very well. We don't cross the line. We we try not to cross the line. And I think we're pretty good at not crossing the line of, uh, you know, being heavy handed with with with, it, with an employee or employees who are supposed to take on the responsibility and are maybe having some trouble doing that. I, I think we're we're good at realizing that sometimes it takes us a couple of months to say it. Uh, and then we do try to do something about it. But again, that's the result of being a small business, but culture in a business like this attitude and personality are really, really key. Culture in regards to growth. That's boy, that's a, that can be a potential minefield if you don't have the right people in place. It, it's, that's a that's a very very entangled subject to talk about because there's so many things that are tied to that. Um, but you know, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. The, uh, the you know uh, the the whole micromanaging things got to go away. That has to be that has to go away in an organized and structured fashion. You know, with goals and and, and budgets and things set up that 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 people can that shoot for because these guys can do it. We know they can do it, so. Um, well, with in the context of empowerment, it's, and in the context of changing the trajectory of a business to trying to get after growth, when you've got a stable workforce, right, and then you're trying to say, all right, let's take this thing up a notch. Could be a change of ownership, or just a change of philosophy that you want to start to be more growth oriented, right? Sure, exactly. And then in the context of empowerment, how do you get your employees on board with that? I guess is a question. I'll give you an example. John had a, a, we were getting into a philosophical discussion over the holidays, a little bit of downtime, doing our, you know, d delivering equipment. We had a lot of disruption. So the machines were down. So a little quieter in the plant. And he made a comment that, yeah, this was, this was my business, so to speak. I might want just one or two operators, one machine, a simpler business versus where we're at now, multiple machines, two locations, uh, a lot of growth oriented mindset. So we were kind of getting into, okay, I get it. And you might be able to make more money too, by the way, in the short term, which is the simple one machine, one person operation deal. Uh, simpler in a lot of ways, a lot less stress. There's a sure. case to be made for that. Um, you, you, you kind of, at some point, you just got to pick where you want to be. Uh, do you need to expand to increase the stability and overall sustainability of the business? Or do you stay small? But there's a key operator within the business that had a different mindset than where we are wired that he's still, he's a great problem solver and, and he gets where we're going and all that, but in a very mindset, small guy, very if you're going to empower people, everyone's got to understand what the mindset of the company is and where you're going and why you're going there. Right. Right. They might not have to have the same exact, they might not have to do it the same way if they were in charge of the whole thing. And that's okay. But you, they've got to understand where are you going in the next three years or four years Said differently, why should an employee, whoever the employee is, why should they work at your business versus mine? Why should they spend time at Paver Art or Joe's Landscaping or Amazon versus mm -hmm. Paver Art? I think an owner's really got to figure that thing out. As it yeah. relates to empowerment, it starts at there. An employee, this is a free country, right? The, America is the ultimate choice. You can choose to work at Paver Art. At Shoprite, at MIT, Google, wherever you can get a job, it's a competitive market for talent. And an, an owner's got to, at some level, say, "I'm in a competitive market for talent. How do I get the best people or the the people that I need to run the business, especially in a tight labor market like we've been in for the past how many years? Has this tight labor market been going on? 
six, yeah. seven. Yeah, exactly. So, well, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to throw this. I'm going to throw this back at you because you use this term all the time. You know, if you're not growing, you're dying. Now, you know, you say that. <clears throat> and yeah, does that pertain here? It's, does that pertain to what you're just talking about? I think it's everything. It's that's that's an overriding philosophical table stakes feeling undeniable truth that you have. So that's that's one I have in a competitive world, whether you've got 90 percent market share or 0.9 percent market share. If you're not growing and building a better business, you're vulnerable to something. Competitors, high commodity costs, tight labor markets that's just one of those things. It's an unshakable truth in my mind. And by the way, if you're an employee coming into pay for it, if you don't realize that or any, anybody that's got that mindset and they actually operate consistent with that mindset as an employee, you are in for a world of hurt. If you don't understand an undeniable truth, that's just one example. I mean, you bring up a great point because that's, if you were to think about an undeniable truth for me, that's one of them. Probably this heart and hustle concept that you can, Work your ass off, you can get better, and you can still make a better life for employees in that world. That's my kind of my governing, uh, that kind of balances me out a little bit. Other sure. companies have different ones. It could be financial, it could be it could be a lot of different things. Every company is a little different. But there's probably one or two or three undeniable truths that you've got to recognize as an employee, or you're going to be freaking miserable if you're operating contrary to what... Uh, imagine if somebody came in and just want to stay stasis and not learn new things. How are that going to work out here? It's not going to work out very well. No. You can't uh, hide on if you if you just want to do your job and leave, and you're not thinking about how to make things better. That's going to be a very difficult person. They're they're just they're ultimately going to self select out if they can't figure out how to get better, how to innovate, how to do. So that's kind of an example. So you, you know you're right. I mean, how do you? I mean, I, I guess the question is where it becomes really stressful is if someone comes in with an undeniable principle, like if you're not growing and you're dying and they're not willing to do shit to help you get there, then then you got a really hard problem. Then then everyone's just stress. You got conflict everywhere, right? So yeah, it's, the weak, it's the weak link in the chain. Uh, there's, there's no question about that. Um, I, you, that's, it's an interesting concept. Part of growing your business, let's, let's assume for the moment that that, that you're in the, the idiom that you speak is 100% true. If you're not, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. Part of growing your business is not just assuming more risk, investing more money, uh, learning more skills, you know, uh, uh, spreading the empowerment concept throughout the organization, uh, better delegation of authority. It's problem solving. And what we've seen that manifest itself here over the last two or three weeks. Uh, we've never done anything here at Paver Art that went 100% smoothly. Now, again, I, I'm speaking specifically about Paver Art. Anybody that's listening to this podcast can, can probably say the same thing. If you're growing, you have to be problem solving. If you're problem solving, you have to have people in place that are capable of doing that and a management in place that allows them to do that and gives them the resources to problem solve and the um, uh, uh, make sure that they have the skills to problem solve, help them with that, and then make sure that they've got the time to do that. It's easy to delegate, but when you're delegating, especially from a, pop, a problem solving standpoint, you can put too much on some on, on a person. Okay. There's Especially you hit somebody with like five different problems that have to be handled all. Sometimes, sometimes in a small business, you have no choice. They're coming anyway, whether you like it or not. You know, we had a, uh, we, we had the situation with, uh, uh, with a refurbished piece of equipment that needed to be reinstalled. All of a sudden we're in a position where we can't, you know, that the person that was going to do that's not going to do that anymore. Okay. They're not part of our organization. They're, they're a separate entity. Okay, we have to we have to solve that problem. Well, that took a few meetings to kind of get that underfoot, and nobody volunteered to do that. Okay, that's got to come from the top, but an understanding that this is a problem that's difficult for us to solve because we're 
you know, we're not experts at water jet. I mean, we're pretty good, but we're not, we're not water jet technicians. You know what I mean? That's basically where this, this, this problem occurred. You know, there are ways to fix that, but you've got to make sure that the, you got to make sure that the team in place is empowered to make those decisions. Well, too. let's go back to, it's a great example. If you're not growing, you're dying. When I came into Paverard, Paverard had a ton of strengths, but we, one of the biggest weaknesses that we had is we had an, what I call an underdeveloped network across a lot of different areas. Weak yep. IT. Absolutely. We had, yeah. we had weak outside. We had four walls and nobody's crossing those four walls. Right. So right. if our machines break down, <clears throat> we do the best we can, to, to, but we had no professional network of people that were around us until we developed a tech through an emergency, right? A relationship. Yep. Well, like all relationships, sometimes they come and go. So we had a good three-year relationship. He's gone off to do another thing, right? Another phase of life. God bless sure. him. Wish him luck. And now we're right back to where we started. So back to if you're growing, if you're not growing, you're dying. The people in the operations world, we're like two degrees of separation away from people that supply us stuff for the water jet or whatever machine that's important, that they can get us in touch with 10 people within a week, probably. And we just start networking with people that are kind of doing what we are just in different worlds. And we just start networking our way. So, so the concept of empowerment is we can be in a bind every time we have a problem or we can grow in our little phase of the world. And how do you grow? Let me talk to four companies that I've never met before and see if I can get 15 minutes of their time and develop a relationship. I mean, so now if you had four or five relationships outside of our business in similar areas, kind of like a networking share group, that makes you stronger as a company. So employees don't need to understand financial management, understand revenue growth of 10% versus 20%. What's that all mean? They just need to develop two more relationships in the area that they're touching every day. And that's yeah. a great example of growth. And it's yeah. brought down to their level. And when the thing goes down, if you can call somebody that has now gotten you in touch with a new technician and we start developing a relationship. Now, what does all this take? Are we talking about 30 hours a week of extra work? No. Not really. No. no. You're talking about three or four phone calls and then cultivating a relationship over time when the gun is not to your head. So what you got to kind of do is to say everybody should have two hours a week that they're dedicated to this concept of growth. And you got to kind of define it. So maybe for Brian, it's you got to talk to two or three different companies over the next six months and try and develop a relationship with the goal of we want two available techs or something like that. Start to boil it down into something that's real uh, as it relates to their function. You know, let's get to the heart of what you just said but to, to the heart of what you just talked about i think we'll, we'll look at the three guys that were responsible for getting this business up and running each one of those guys there was no empowering going on it was hey we got to get we got to we got to get some sales <laughs> we got to get shit in here we got to learn how to make this stuff we got to learn how to run the equipment, all that stuff. But having said all that, you become, you, you get to the point where you become so, I mean, you, you, you're part of the equipment. You're, you're one of the tools that makes the business go. Okay. And you feel, even if, even if you personally don't own that piece of equipment, you feel like that piece of equipment is yours, okay? And you, in many cases, you're not waiting for somebody to say, hey, you you really need to take a look at this and you, there's something needs to be done about this piece of equipment. There's a problem here. I see a problem coming up. People who take ownership of that, take ownership of that area that they're responsible for, normally don't need to be told that, okay? They're gonna do a lot of that on their own. Not every employee is like that, but there are employees out there that may not be like that, but are this close to getting there, okay? And maybe that takes the little push from management to, to, to put them in a position where they take control of that on their own and don't wait the next time around. And when you start adopting that attitude where, okay, I got a problem. Here's my problem. You see this problem right here? I'm going to fix this problem and I'm going to fix it right now, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to have time to do these two things over here just yet. 
I want to get this thing done and get, because what this is going to do is if I solve this problem now, that makes it, that gives me tons of time to get to these other items over here. And owning that department, owning that piece of equipment, owning the responsibility for taking care of that, man, that is really key. And you know, you know, you know, you know, people that are like that, whether they're owners in the business or not, they're taking responsibility and they're taking ownership of that, that area, that sphere that they're responsible for. And man, it's, uh, it's so beautiful when you see that. And it's, it's also really beautiful when you see somebody who previously didn't feel that way, but start all of a sudden starts to segue into being that type of person. They had it there all along. They just needed that extra little push to get there. And that's the empowerment concept. And that's, that's what I'm thinking you know, when I think of empowerment. Okay. I, I think you're right. Let me go off on a little tangent and then see if we can bring it back to the, if sure. you had to guess 95% of our audience, we don't even know because we're so young, but we're small business oriented, right? In terms of those are the people that would really gravitate towards our podcasts. Agreed? Exactly. Yep. But let's go to one of the biggest companies in, on the globe, Amazon. They have a headline number this week that they're laying off 18,000 people, which mm -hmm. is a lot of people, but it's only about 2% of their entire workforce. They've got over a million people. Depending on when you Google and what source you're looking at, you can look at Wall Street Journal, New York Times, or five other ones. The generally accepted number for the warehouse employees, so the more blue collar oriented positions, they've got 100 to 150% annual turnover. Turnover. I saw that. I saw that uh, last night when I was doing my research on this. Yeah, it, which is fascinating. So if they have a a DC a distribution center with four thousand people, mm -hmm. the next year they're going to have four thousand new people. I mean that's yeah. that's it's startling, exactly. isn't it? <laughs> that's crazy. So and and we know this anecdotally from all the re <laughs> you know we we I've seen a hundred resumes for for jobs and they all had when eighty percent of them have Amazon on them and they have three months, four months one one week or whatever you know they got a, so there there's truth to and it and you know how much it costs amazon per year on that it costs them eight billion dollars i'm sure it's it's, it's awfully expensive eight billion dollars was the number and 150 percent uh turnover was was you you hit it right on the head i mean we talked like about billion. what was that place in dundalk maryland again uh drug city drug city the crab i, I think that's still one of the most fascinating a drugstore with a crab cake with the Walgreens multi-billion dollar corporation or CVS right down the and road. High, and high-end bourbon tastings. And a bur bourbon tasting room. So now you got Amazon, right? Amazon, everyone's afraid of Amazon and Walmart. And they're multi-trillion dollar market cap companies, multi-billion. But how do you square the fact? They're very profitable. So by any, su any success metric financially, they're the greatest of the great, these companies. Right. Yet they've got 150% turnover or 100% turnover. Square that with the world of small business and what that means for us or the small business world. That would kill us. That which we couldn't run the business. We we couldn't. We absolutely couldn't. There's too many things that each individual employee has to know and learn to become a valuable employee here. And when that employee leaves, that hurts. You know, it's it's it, it hurts. Now, what and about from our our standpoint of trying to recruit? We're competing against Amazon, are we not? Right, we are. Yeah, or it's are almost, we? It well, again, it goes back to the culture. It's almost like you're. It's almost. It's almost like you have to find the person with the right attitude and the right personality to work here. Okay, but, but again, may, if our audience, it, uh, do you think Amazon? And again, I, I don't. I I don't have the answer to this. I'm not. I I don't. I don't have a tap into the uh, into the, into the statistics. But do you, you know, do you, do you think Amazon truly cares or do you think Amazon is just satisfied with the fact that anybody walking through the door is a potential employee of Amazon? And if it works out great and if it doesn't work out, well, that's okay too. You know what I mean? I, I, it's, they're so big and there's so many subdivisions. There's so many DCs. There's, uh, it's. It boggles the mind, and it, maybe it boggles my mind because the control that's in, the, the control that's required to make sure that those employees want to stay, they want to be part of this. This is more than just a paycheck. This is more than just a you know uh, uh, you know uh, medical benefits. 
look, a lot of employees, that's all they want. Okay. And I understand that. I, I think that's perfectly fine. I mean, a, a big chunk of the workforce in this country works under that premise. Um, but in order for a small business to be successful, it's almost like each individual has got to be more than that. They absolutely have to be more than that. It's got to be more than just a paycheck. It's got to be more than just, you know, benefits. It's got to be, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the sense of accomplishment that you have at the end of the day. It's, you know, I built that my name is on that. That doesn't come about if I didn't, I had, and I had three issues that I had to deal with to make that thing come out successfully for that client. And, oh, by the way, um, you know, the feedback that we got from the client on that particular piece was just over the top. They loved it, man. That's, you think you get that from stamping boxes all day and and picking you know picking boxes of uh, hula hoops and you know and bocce balls? There you go. I threw in the bocce ball. The um, you know great you, Italian you, game. Are you getting any? You know what are you getting out of that? Okay. Well, you and I have talked about this before. If if for whatever reason um, I had I had to go take a job at Amazon and I would be happy to do that. I'm not going to be part of that 150%. I'm going to be there in a year. I'm going to be there in two years. I might even be a, I might even be a manager at the end of two years or three years. I, I make it a game. I'm not going to be beaten by the system. I can right. beat the system. But you know? that's you as an individual. So you've got the exactly. competitive fire. So you you might be a manager. You, you probably would be. You, you, you'd rise up in the organization. But just by the raw statistics... The eight people or 15 people that you're managing, next year it's going to be completely different. They're going to be gone. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, now, this is where my bias is coming in, but what kind of fucking world is that? <laughs> yeah. And then, now a... you might be a great manager, but if if you're the average manager, your entire team turned over. What does it say about you? No, it doesn't say very doesn't say anything very good about you. That's so, sure. so back to the world of small business, because if we are, if it is important to figure out empowerment in the context of a culture and what you're trying to achieve, why should they work for you versus me? I right. actually love the fact that Amazon's got 100 to 150 percent turnover. I used to think, in the first two years of paper art, how the hell do you compete with that? Now I think, boy, I, what what a gift to the world that is. That's not our competition. I mean, I don't know if I could design a system that bad to have 150 percent turnover, <laughs> right? I mean, you've got to. If we were to number one, if we designed a system that bad, we'd be out of business. So all the credit in the world to Bezos for building a machine and investing. I mean, God, that is a true. I'm not trying to knock Amazon, but that is hard to square. They have must have built a technological infrastructure where they can afford to do that, or that's part of their business model because they don't want people earning 5% more a year beyond a certain point, And they want the new blood coming in at 15 bucks an hour. And they want to keep, there's got to be a business rationale behind why they're living with that high turnover. Well, they're so big. You would think, and maybe I'm wrong about this, and maybe they've already, maybe they've already figured this out. Maybe they, you know, maybe the people at the top have said, you know what, we can keep running like this for the next fifty years. We're never going to run out of potential employees. It, well, in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, there's a there's a finite number of people that want to work in this country. Okay, as we know, we got seven million of them sitting on their asses right now. But you know, watching watching computer screens and phone screens, two thousand hours a year. Um, but with that in mind, I, I'm thinking at, at some point you're going to run out. I, there's yeah, but, that's you know what? so that's Amazon's that's, that's problem. Amazon's problem. But uh, yeah, exactly. in the world of small business, where we're trying to create something really special, unique, top five percent of the world company within a given niche or whatever it is, the small business opportunity, the drug city in Dundalk with the crab cake and the bourbon tasting room. Right. Do you think they've got 150 percent turnover that that company? No. no. I bet no. there's people that grew up in Dundalk. We, we got to get this guy in the pod. We keep talking about him. They grew up in Dundalk, Maryland. They went to go work at the Drug City. I bet they've got people that have been there a decade plus, multiple people. Yeah. Oh, exactly. and my nephew works at the Drug City, and they're probably talking about it. So I think the small business opportunity, by the very nature of being small, can take an employee, and let's just say it's minimum wage, and grow them to make in close to six figures, and then bring new people in. Same thing, and then grow them. Now, think about that if you start at 19 years old or doesn't matter what age, 30 years old. And by the time you're 40, 
you've stayed with that little business, if it's a growth company and you're empowered to make decisions and you've got the autonomy and you get rewarded for good results as a result of learning new things and growing within your job, you've now got something special. I mean, we've got a core of people. And in what another way is everyone defines and calculates turnover differently, right? How right. I think about it in the con, if we've got six employees and five, let's just say five is a stable, stable five every single year, yet we've mm -hmm. got one position, it's kind of called the new feeder position, that it, it takes us six people to fill that one position and get it right. But you've got mm -hmm. a core of five. I kind of think of that as one relative to six, not the six times relative to the six. You follow me? I do. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Now that, that's a lot of churn on that one position that you got to get right. It shows you how hard it is to, but that's, we're not turning over to five. We're, we're trying to get that six, one nailed down, right. And it might take us six people to do that one position. So I'm not sure that's the right way to think about turnover. Everyone calculates it differently, but right. um, in the world event, when you've got 150% turnover, you've got a brand new workforce every year. Well, you bring up you bring up a very interesting point. I also and I've got some I've got some data here. I've got some facts. Well, they look like they're, um, you know, I, I looked into where the facts came from, and and, and it, it appears to be all this appears to be very very legitimate. You know, we're talking about turnover. The, um, you know. Just 16% of employees around the world consider themselves fully engaged. Okay. Wow. Now, engaged and empowered are basically, uh, you know, your uh, same room, numbers. different chair. Exactly. Yeah. Different chairs. 16% um, of the, uh, what was that, of the entire working world? Yep. The entire working world. Consider, the, the, uh, you know, uh, what, what a, only 16%. Yeah, exactly. This one knocked me off my pins. 80% of the global workforce is not working at its full potential. Okay. This comes you, from AD. This can you go back to that first step, the 16%? That 16% yes. are not fully engaged? Six, only 16% are fully engaged. So, so there's 84% 80, 80, that are not. So 84% of the world is not fully engaged. Correct. The working world, the working world. Boy, how pathetic is that? I, I know it's a uh, that, that is life. freaking said differently. If they're going to use an art, our, our terminology of graded from a uh, an E to an A plus or whatever, right? That's a that's a not D minus. It's way <laughs> that's that's a failing grade by beyond any. And they're spending 40 hours a week at their job. I mean, they are miserable people, they've got to be by default. I know. And it's, uh, well, uh, here's All another right, well, one of my favorites that I found. You got to, you got to hear this one. Companies with a highly engaged workforce achieve a 41% reduction in absenteeism, 41%, a 17% increase in productivity and 59% less turnover. This goes directly to the discussion we just had about Amazon. And by the way, that was done by the by the Gallup people. That poll yeah, was done by the Gallup. That's people. legit. Yeah. So it's um so the business case is obvious for having an engaged, empowered workforce. Uh, here's one too that's going to go very near and dear to your heart. Um now this is the this is from the ITA group research back in 2019. Uh engaged employees are 15 times more likely. 15 times more likely to recommend the company to friends and colleagues. Now we just had that happen to us. Okay. Different context. We talked about it in a different way, but the new guys that we've taken on, we came, they came on, they're all kind of members of the same family. Okay. And when we ask them, hey, do you know anybody that would be interested? We, we need one more guy. Can you help us out with that? Are you interested? You know, by the way, it's that's a, you know, where to hire employees. Boy, have we learned some shit in the last two years. The uh, you know, what works and what don't work. Um, we but, could write a book on what don't work. But but fifteen times more likely to recommend the company to friends and colleagues. Those are the, the those are the folks that are engaged. Um. 1.5 times more willing to learn new skills and responsibilities, okay? 
We've had some experience with that too. Um, almost six times more likely to plan on staying for a full career. Now, what I've seen in the last 15 to 20 years in the workforce, the United States, the U.S. workforce, when you're looking at people with college educations, and I know that's a dirty word around here, but uh, but the people with college educations, um, they're staying on jobs two and three years and moving on to other jobs, but they're moving up. They're taking on more responsibility. They're making more money. Uh, they want to be do they want to be doing things that they want to do. And, you know. The fact that six times more likely engaged employees are six times more likely to plan on staying for a full career. That's staggering. I mean, my God, you know, it's you, you, you're saying the company that saves the company so much money and the investment that you have to make. We've been talking about that for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, the investment that the company has to make to kind of ensure that those, those employees are engaged. It's, you know, you're not spending a lot of money to do that. In fact, you're not spending any money at all. It's a question of properly managing that whole thing. Um, but by the way, disengaged employees are 2.3 times more likely to be exploring other jobs. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. And almost three times more likely to live with or to leave within three months. Or I'm sorry, leave within 12 months. I There's so many reasons to get this concept down and get it down right and do it right and work it every day in your small business. It's, it's, and by the way, happier employees. I mean, look, there, you got to admit around here. I mean, there's just, we're breaking balls every day. Okay. It's, and that's part of that. That's part of the engagement that we have between the employees, but that also breaks down all those, those nasty walls where they think that the people who are running the business are assholes. Right. Okay. I don't think we have that here. I really don't. Now, look, I'm just being honest. I mean, you know, this is a, uh, you know, warts and all, let's talk about this, but all those numbers that I just gave you, wow. I can't think of how many more, how many more reasons do we need to have to ensure that empowerment and delegation are serious concepts in a small business, not just ours, but any small business. And well, it, it almost takes the, smaller or larger than ours. Yeah. All the, the stats that you rattled off says you get an engaged, empowered employee, your business results are going to be 5X, right? The off average. the charts. The problem yeah. is it goes back to the bell curve. What was it? 84% are not in that mode. Correct. So. Yeah. So I, and I don't know if that means 84% of the world is more miserable than happy. I, I don't know if you can go that far, but they're not where they need to be. But you got to figure a big chunk of that 84% is just like that. Yeah. They're and then the problem is you're dealing with happy. human beings, right? Yeah. You've got what makes you tick at your job is going to be different than what makes Brian tick or John or, or, or somebody else or me, right? Right. You know, people are different personalities. They're motivated by different things. Some it's money. A lot of people, it's not money. Some it's freedom and autonomy. I mean, there's a laundry list. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. This is part of the challenge with Amazon when you've got millions of people or sure. 4,000 people in a DC. Hard to manage a one-on-one -on -one relationship amongst a workforce of 4,000 people, right? When you've got 10, a lot easier, you would think. But I say that, and then, then you and I go back to wearing a lot of different hats. Can you really have a one-on-one -on -one relationship and really understand that should be the goal? But- Difficult. It's it's eighty four percent not fully engaged, not fully optimized in their world. That's right. a big number. Well, I'll tell you what it does. It but your net promoter score. You, what the key metric that you were rattling off? What was it? Uh, likely to recommend somebody else to come in. Uh, um, fifteen times more likely to recommend so that, somebody to work for your company. The, I think yeah. the fancy term for that is the net promoter score of a business. So if you buy something from my business how likely are you to recommend it to your neighbor that it was a cool product, whatever that is, or yep. you work at a company, how likely are you to bring in your buddy to work at that company? That's a great sign or a great telltale sign when you're looking at a business of the people that are working there. How did they get the job? Are they all coming off the streets or is Jim Bob who works in maintenance bringing in two to three people a year because he wants them to bring in to, to work and he values it. He respects his job. He wants them to be a part of it. 
pretty big tell right there when people are bringing in other people. Yeah, it is. And that's, uh, look, it's in a tight labor market like the one we're experiencing, that type of help to for a small business is, man, that is so key. Uh, you know, I look at where we, you know, at, as a small business, and, and small businesses need to do this too. They can look back, they can go back five years and see where they were five years ago in regards to their employee 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 uh, employee morale uh engaged employees empowered employees what they've done to try to make that work and compare that to today and if you've gone if you've not done anything with that or you've not gone anywhere that's a problem that's a serious serious problem you're not going to grow and the guy at the top uh you know the the owner of the business the entrepreneur the small business owner can squawk and holler all he wants but if you if, if the people that are in place aren't going to aren't going to you know, take that on and to take on that responsibility that's you're not going to grow and you know what you're going to stay right about here and you're you know i think the reason we stayed where we were in sales for such a long time was not because we weren't engaged we were certainly engaged there were so few of us that this was our life. This was our business. This, you know, one can understand why that's the case, but we didn't take the steps to bring on more people and convince them to become part of the team and uh, invest, invest and take a little bit more risk. You know, we, we didn't do that. All right. It's almost, you can almost get comfortable in that survival mode, but if you're not growing, you're dying. That's number one. Number two, those people that are part of your team, have to be proactive parts of your team and, and very important parts of your team to make sure that that uh, that that uh, that that business is moving forward and growing. Well, here so, another, another simple. A lot of this, you know, money always helps. If you got capital, that's why I'm a big believer. You got to be capitalized in a business. Right. You can't be over leveraged with debt. Uh, I've lived in highly leveraged environments and environments uh, without debt. Payroll has got no debt. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would think we're appropriately capitalized for a small business. How did we get our last two employees, which we think are going to be rock stars? Well, that's pretty easy. The um, um, Our last two new employees. Of, yeah, one of the contractors that that we're working with. Um, knew, knew them right away. They were family members. Yeah, that's... And one, one happened we to asked be, them about it. And by the way, both of those guys were there the next day. One, one was there the next day. The other one was there in two days, was here in two days. Now, now something simple. Contractor doing work for us on an expansion project. Right. We got a contract or a, a agreement with him. You think I'm going to wait for him to ask me for money? Or I'm just going to give him money once a week. So let's just say it's 100 bucks, And he wants half up front, half when it's in. Well, what if I give him 100 bucks and I just keep feeding him every single week to get him to that? Wouldn't mm-hmm. that be kind of like a breath of fresh air, find a way to treat your partners, your vendors, your suppliers, your contractors, whoever is on a periphery that might be able to help you with customers or employees, treat them a little better than the norm. What What is that going to cost you? Why? And I'm, I'm still amazed at people that take the 30 days to pay somebody because they're not capitalized, right? Yeah. So let's say he had terms with me of pay me 20 days after the job. And I did that. I'd be within the contract, no problem. Sure. But- why make an investment still pay it a hundred bucks whatever it is pay it quicker pay it along the way because you know they got bills along the way i mean it's simple things like that that owners can do i haven't seen any do it in our business i don't know why they probably don't have the money is why (laughs) generally i bet the 16 or the 84 percent that are not fully engaged they're also not well capitalized in their personal lives so Part of this concept, and I hate to make everything about financials, but your underlying financial strength, and this is why employees got to be thinking about this too. One of the greatest uh, little uplifts, what one of our team members said, I just bought my first two shares of the S&P 500 index. And we were talking about financial planning and starting. Man, I went home that night and we were talking about starting early and compounding the compound interest. And sure. he was thinking about it already. But I'm like, how cool is that? working on our team, getting better at his job, growing from where he started, and then now he's going to start building a little wealth. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. But the but a business owner, I, I've said it a million times, they've got to have the financial wherewithal, so not growing, you're dying, to build up their capital base a little bit each year and then deploy that capital in a way that's going to be good to people, right? And that could be your employees or whatever it is. But those are little investments that you can make that you're not spending more money. You're just doing it in a more thoughtful, caring way. Sure. Well, I that's uh, that's one of the things that I like about the way we are, okay? The way we are here and the way we are now. Um, and, you know. Now, by the way, people will take advantage of that. If they know you're you're wired that uh, way. Yeah, that's that's true. But um the that's part of that concept that you know, yes, there money is an incentive, but it's not the only incentive. If it were the only incentive, fewer people would be leaving Amazon in, in droves. Okay. Um, you know, if money was the only incentive, you know, because they pay pretty well, their benefits are pretty good. Um, but there's other things there that are driving those people away. I don't know what it is. I, I you know, I, I'm sure I'll, at some point down the road, I'll read more up more into this because it's kind of an interesting subject to you. Well, they're right? measuring people's performance. It, well, okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. Let's, let's understand, let's make sure that, you know, that, because you and I both feel this way, uh, measuring performance is not a bad thing. In right. fact, measuring performance is mandatory. It's extremely important, um, but and and maybe yeah. But when you're talking about that kind of turnover, that that turnover is so massive. There's something else there. There has to be something else there. Okay, you know, uh, on virtually every job, you're being measured on your performance. I, I don't care if you're working in a uh, you know at a fast food joint or whether you're working at Pave Right or where you're working at Amazon, but um, you know encouragement support um a good attitude a good working attitude you know surrounded by good personalities interesting people people that you know that you like to talk to you like to you know we have that here now it's it's that that's you know that's manifesting itself more and more every day and um you know as we get bigger that's going to you know, that's going to get more and more involved. And we just can't lose that attitude. We can't lose that. We can't lose that paver art culture that we have. Um, no, I think, well, let me ask you the question on the one-to-one -one relationship piece, right? If the sure. business case is obvious that an engaged employee returns 5X or just a better business, that a better a successful business make an engaged employee versus that 84% that's not, how exactly. do you do that person by person? How do you number? I guess number one. How do you assess? Are your team members in the eighty four percent or the sixteen percent? I mean, is it obvious? You think, or you're too small not to notice. You're going to see when somebody's not happy. You're you, virtually every employee in this organization, and we've gone from two to now uh, we're we're eight. I know every one of these people pretty well. Okay. If you know when you're, you know, when one of your kids is not happy, there's a problem and they're not telling you about it. And it, you know, a good parent wants to know what's the problem. Hey, Billy, what's, what's going on? What's it? That's the, that's the way it is here in a small business, especially this particular small business. You just know if there's a problem. You have to take, you can't ignore it. You have to take the time and find out what that is. Are you having an issue with paver art? Are you having an issue with me? Are you having an issue with Mark? Uh, you know, is it, is it your job? Talk to us. Let us know what's going on. You know, we're a small enough organization that we can do that every day. And we're, and we're engaging with people every day. We know when somebody's not happy, okay? And they don't want to talk about it or tell you about it. Sometimes you got to be a nudge and 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 then pull that out of them. That's that's how you know, um, you know, uh, when there's problems brewing. It's a sixth sense almost. Sometimes you you have to have that. In small organizations, you can do that. Big organizations, that's a whole different deal. It's you become more of a number. You become more of a you know. Uh, it's it's more of a you know, it's more of a, a, a protocol and 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 more of a, a list of things that you have to meet. And I, 
that's fine, but we're engaged with the employees here. Okay. Maybe we can even do better than we can do better than, than what we have, but um, I don't know. Does that answer, does, does yeah. that give you some semblance of an answer to your question? I, I think you're, you hit the nail, you know, the, one of the best, uh, what MBWA Tom Peters in the late 70s or early eighties management by wandering around. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember that. Get out of your office and just wander and then get, get in someone else's environment. See what the hell did you just shoot the shit a little bit and try and get a sense for which by the way, sometimes you need when you're answering a freaking phone all day and you're grinding. <laughs> next thing you know, you look up and it's three 45 and you've been there since six doing nothing but that. Yeah, you know, exactly. the management by wandering around breaks that monotony and, and gets you a little sense for what the hell's going on uh, in your own operation. So um, best part of this, the best part of our expansion has been going over and testing the waters and seeing how the employees have kind of grasped this. We, you know, where you basically say, look, that's your area. Do what you got to do to make it work. Uh, here's some ideas. I'm sure you've got more. Go do that. I love getting up out of this chair and going across the going across the parking lot to the new space and and seeing how every day, little by little, that's turning into an assembly line. That's turning into a workable you know, operations uh, driven situation that we didn't have in that department when it was over here. And, and the guys that are in there and working in that department are kind of they're taking that bull by the horns, pardon the pun. But they're taking that bull by the horns and uh, doing a pretty good job with that, I think. I, I you know, it, it's it, it's look, at, it, we have to do that because you know, I think they also understand that customers are requiring that too. Customers don't want long lead times. Cust this is, you know, this is the Amazon. Speaking of Amazon, this is the Amazon culture that we've created, the Walmart culture that we created. I want it now. Period. End of story. They'll give you a little bit of levity or a little levity. That's the wrong word. They'll give you a little bit of leeway. Okay. But not much because they can go someplace else and look for their business and, and get their business elsewhere. So I well, think look, the what, guys, the guys are grasping that concept. What, what's pretty cool. What, what, what I'm proud about with paver art and, and this podcast is we had Angelo on the episode and then he came in and he gave us a, it was like a religious experience of things that we got to get right in terms of a brutal assessment. <laughs> it was a, which we needed, right? It was a good wake up. Absolutely. Call. No, no, we welcome that. And then, now we're in a construction project and, you know, by golly in six months, <laughs> if our lead times aren't better than what they are with another machine, twice the space, another facility, uh, right. you know, so we put real hard money into that now, you know, um, so that, that's pretty cool in terms of uh, what we're trying to do, but none of the, you know, this, We've said it a gazillion times. None of this is easy, but I think you're right. The are you empowered? Are you engaged or not? Should not be for a small business owner, general manager. Mm -hmm. Should not be a hard thing to assess one by one. It should not be a hard thing to draw out of people. How's life going? Tell me how you're feeling and see what they say. And you can kind of get a sense of people are bullshitting you or not. I Knowing know. that the stakes are five times the amount of performance on the highly engaged versus the no engaged. Right. It's a pretty good payoff right there. There is. So I, you know, it's um, I would have had a different take on this whole discussion topic five years ago. I think it would have been a, a completely different discussion. Now that. In our particular case, yes, we're still a small business, but we're a larger small business than we were. I think taking... the, small, the small business owner, when you look at the Amazons of the world, this topic of empowerment, if this can't be the competitive advantage for a small business to compete and survive, I don't know right. what is. It's yeah, a it's... big topic. I mean, we got to dive deeper into it as the podcasts go by. But the more I think about the drug cities and Dundalks, the Amazon turnover, the paver arts, being small is a great asset. And to build a small business that's growing at an accelerated rate where you can invest back into people... Great spot to be in. Yeah, it's um, well, and it's fun too, you know. And the I, guys, I think a lot of the guys, they, it's, it's not just fun, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs>